you haven't noticed already, the exams are graded. They're up here. And what I'd like to do is to spend most, if not all, of this class going over the exam. And so first of all, the experiment we did seems to have helped. So I remember I told you that I used to give an exam like this, and I would always give the students an hour to do it. Um, and this year, we decided to do an experiment and make a similar exam would give you two hours to do it. So the average score has gone up about 10 points by doing that. So that's a nice thing. I, mean, I hadn't necessarily expected that. Um, so I guess giving you more time actually lets you show that you do know this stuff. Um, this is the distribution of scores. Uh, the high was 95. That's actually not very different than last year. Uh, the low was 44. Uh, there were a few lower scores last year. Uh, remember that this is a mixed class of graduates and undergraduates. And we don't compare apples and oranges. So the undergraduates are graded on one curve and the graduates are graded on a different curve. So I've separated them out. For the undergrads, the high score was 86. The low was 44, the average was 73. And for the grad students, the high was 95, the low was 54, and the average was 76.7. And for those of you who are dying to know, the average score in this class for undergraduates is going to be a B. Okay, so to some extent, it doesn't actually matter where that average is. If it had come out 40, I would have blamed it on myself for writing a lousy exam. In any event, uh, the average will be a B for, uh, for undergrads. Uh, so if you look at that and you find yourself in that, you can sort of judge where you are relative to your classmates. And, you know, if you're near the bottom, then you need to start thinking about doing something different. And that means coming and see me, coming and seeing the TAs, maybe putting a little more effort in on the homeworks, whatever it takes. Okay? Okay. So what I'd like to do is to go through the exam and point out where I saw issues. And the way we graded this is, just so you're clear, um, each of the GSIs graded one problem. I graded two of them because I like to see, get some feel for how people are doing. Um, if you have issues with the way the grade points were assigned, come see me and we'll figure out what to do about it, okay? Okay. So the first problem was supposed to be a relatively simple one and most people got most of it. Um, so let's just go through it. The first part, there were three nuclear reactions written down and the idea was to complete them to make a balanced nuclear equation. And the basic idea here is you have to conserve both the numbers of protons, the numbers of neutrons, and so on. So in the first one, what it said on the exam was nitrogen 15 plus what goes to helium 4 plus carbon 12. What I didn't do was put in the proton and neutron numbers. The idea was if you looked at nitrogen 15, you had a periodic table on the sheet. So you could go look up nitrogen if you didn't know it to find out that had seven protons. And since the isotope of interest was labeled 15, you were then supposed to figure out that meant there had to be eight neutrons in that nucleus. And similarly for the products, you look up helium, you look up carbon, you figure out the number of neutrons and protons in each of them. And then you figure out what do I have to add so that the number of protons on the left equals the number of protons on the right. And since I had seven protons locked up in my nitrogen 15, and I had a total of eight protons on the other side. I have to add something that has one proton. I had eight neutrons on the left and eight neutrons on the right, so therefore I couldn't add any neutrons. And the one particle which has a proton and no neutrons is hydrogen one. Okay, so that's the logic behind all of these problems. For number two, uh, for B rather, it's polonium 18, 218, sorry, um, undergoing a decay in which a helium four nucleus is produced. So it's an alpha decay. Again, we look up polonium and see the Z is 84. The N must be 134 so that number of neutrons plus number of protons adds up to the A value of 218. And then we do the arithmetic, 84 minus two makes 82. So I know I must have a lead nucleus there. And 134 minus two is 132. So I end up with lead 214, okay? And then, the next one was a slightly different kind of decay, but again, something we talked about. So this is rubidium 81 going to krypton 81. So we look up rubidium and see that it has 37 protons in its nucleus. Krypton only has 36. And I've got 44 neutrons here and 45 over there. So this is a little different reaction. I'm not 
rearranging the neutrons and protons. I'm actually turning a neutron, sorry, turning a proton into a neutron. That's a positively charged object producing an electrically neutral object. I have to spit out something positively charged. That's a positron. And then the thing I was hoping you would remember is that the positron, like the neutrons and protons, have spin a half. Therefore, there has to be another half integer spin particle emitted. And that's the thing we call the neutrino. Okay? And whether you said it was an electron neutrino or not doesn't really matter. Any questions about the first three problems? First three parts of that problem. Okay, the last one, I like this kind of problem. It's sort of cute because you actually have to think. Um, so the idea was, I said that you have thorium-232 uh, decay chain, which ends up at lead-208. And the question is, how many alphas and how many betas must be emitted in that sequence? And, you know, at first thought, you might think, I have to know the decay schemes of all these nuclei. But in fact, you don't. Uh, but you do need to know the Zs and As of these things. And so I gave you the A's, 232 and 208. What I didn't give you were the Z's, but again, the idea is you use the periodic table to find that information out. So thorium is Z of 90, lead is Z of 82. And the change in A going from thorium 232, <coughs> excuse me, to lead 208 is 24 units, okay? And the change of Z in going from thorium to lead is eight units. And we're trying to understand how to do that with a combination of alpha and beta decays. In alpha decay, we change the A by four units each time an alpha is emitted. So if I change the A by four units here, then I must have six alphas emitted, okay? Just to get the A change right. Because in beta decay, I don't change the A at all. But when I do an alpha decay, in addition to changing the A by four units, I change the Z by two units. So if I have six alpha decays, that means I would change the Z of the nucleus by 6 times 2 or 12, but I only changed it by 8. So in order to get me back 4 units of charge, I need to have 4 beta decays as well. So the answer is 4 beta decays and 6 alpha decays. Everybody see that? Okay. I like that. Okay. So that was the easy one to get you started. The second one was not terribly difficult, but there were a lot of steps involved. And a lot of people had some difficulties with the total calculation. So let's go through that in gory detail. So this is a nuclear reaction production and decay kind of problem. Okay? And so the question was, you've got a target that's being bombarded with a current of a certain amount. And you're told that we're producing two different isotopes that have different half-lives and have different production cross-sections. And the question is, after a certain amount of time, which in this problem is 12 hours, you're first asked to calculate the activity of each of these guys that would be present in the target at the end of that bombardment. And the important point that a number of people forgot about was that while you're producing these things, they are also decaying. They don't stop their decay just because you've got your accelerator running. And if you want to know the amount of activity that's present at the end of the bombardment, you have to account for both the production and the decay. And we did discuss that in class, and you did have some homework problems on that. Um, and then the second part had to do with calculating the activity a certain period of time after the bombardment ended. So to do the first part, what you need to do is calculate, first of all, the reaction rate. That is, how quickly we're producing each of these isotopes. And the basic formula for a production rate is written up there in one of the forms you've seen before. It gets written differently depending on exactly how the problem is phrased. But for this way the, of setting up the problem, that's the right form. So what it says is the production rate, which I'm calling R, is a product of three quantities. I represents the number of projectiles that are hitting your target, and that's a number per unit time. Sigma is the cross-section, the measure of the probability for the particular reaction we're talking about to happen. That has units of area. And then this funny product, NT, is a measure of how many target nuclei the projectiles see per unit area as they pass through it. Okay, and you can express that in different ways, but an important point in all these problems is to make sure you're doing things in a dimensionally consistent way. That is, if I say that this is a production rate, that means it's going to be a number per unit time. That's what I end up calculating. And so I better make sure that the units of the quantities I've got on the other side of the equal sign give me the appropriate units in the final answer. So I, the number of projectiles, is going to be a number per unit time. 
sigma cross-section has units of area. It's stated in the problem that way. And so NT better be a number per unit area so that the dimensions cancel out properly. Okay, so first of all, the problem was stated with giving you an electrical current for the proton beam. You need to convert that into the number of protons per second. So 10 nanoamps is 10 to the minus eighth coulombs per second divided by the elementary charge of a proton. Some people thought the proton had two units of charge. I don't know why. Um, in any event, you get the number of protons per second then, 6.24 times 10 to the 10th. That's how many are hitting the target. Um, NT, the way the problem was stated, it was said the target was 30 milligrams per square centimeter. So you divide that by the atomic weight of the target material, which is rhodium-103. Um, in some cases, people were a little confused about which mass to use there. I noticed some people used 103 when we were talking about the production of palladium-103 and used 101 when we were talking about the production of palladium-101. That's not right. It's the number of target atoms we're talking about, not the number of product atoms. So it's always going to be the number of product atoms, so it would be 103 in the denominator there, and we multiply it by Avogadro's number. So we end up with the number of target atoms per square centimeter being 1.75 times 10 to the 20th. And then we can calculate the production rate for the two different isotopes. So for rhodium one, sorry, palladium 103, it's 6.24 10 to the 10th times the cross section for making that isotope, which was given as 5 times 10 to the minus 26 square centimeters times the number of target atoms. And we end up with a production rate of 5.46 times 10 to the fifth per second. So that's the rate at which we're producing palladium-103. And exactly the same procedure for palladium-101. And because its cross-section is four times higher, uh, we produce four times as many per second. It doesn't mean necessarily there are going to be four times as many present at the end of the run, because like I said before, while we're producing them, they're also decaying. And so the formula that you needed to use, which I was very pleasantly surprised to see some people actually derive in the exam. You didn't have to do that, but if you did, um, you got some extra brownie points, let's put it that way. Um, but you could have written this down on your cheat sheet so that you know that the number of radioactive species present as a function of time while you're producing them looks like the production rate R, these things we just calculated there, divided by the decay constant that's appropriate for that particular isotope times this quantity 1 minus e to the minus lambda t. And the, the way the problem was stated is I wanted the activity, not the number. So you just take n lambda, which is the activity, and this just becomes r times 1 minus e to the minus lambda t. In the problem that said the bombardment lasted for 12 hours, so that's the t that's going to go in here. And the lambdas we calculate separately for the 103 and 101 as the logarithm of 2 divided by the half-life. So those are the two lambdas. I plug those into this formula along with the uh, T of 12 hours and the production rate appropriate for each isotope. And I end up getting the activity for the 103 palladium at the end of the bombardment is 1.1 times 10 to the fourth per second. I didn't actually ask you for any particular set of units for the activity. So either quoting it this way or saying that's Becquerel's or converting it to Curie's, they were all fine. And similarly for the 101, uh, the activity is a lot higher, uh, mainly because the half-life is so much shorter. Question? Uh, what's the point rate now? Oh, thank you. Thank you. Sorry. Um, so on problem two, it was 13 for part A and 12 for B. And for the first one, I think it was 6, 6, 6, and 7. Sorry, I didn't mention that. Okay, so those are the activities that are present at the end of the bombardment. Um, some people simply took the production rate and multiplied it by the time. You end up getting very close to the right answer here because the half-life is long, but that isn't the right procedure. Okay, some people argued that in fact it was a good approximation, and if they did that, they got points for that. But if you just neglected to mention it at all, I took off points for that. And then the second part was okay, at the end of the bombardment, you turn the beam off and now you wait three days. What happens, what's the activity present after three days? And the idea there was once you turn off the beam, things just decay freely with their own half-lives. And so each one undergoes exponential decay. And so the activity of 103 is at some time t is the activity 
A0, and we can measure that wherever we like, but we might as well take it to be the end of the bombardment, since we've already calculated the activity there. Uh, and then e to the minus lambda 103t, and similarly for 101. And the time we want to use is three days, because we're measuring it from the end of the bombardment, where we know how much activity we had present. And so we plug those numbers in here, and we get that the activity of the 103 hardly changes, because its half-life is 17 days and we're only talking about a three-day decay period. So this activity is very nearly equal to what it was at the end of the bombardment, whereas the 101, since its half-life is so much shorter, it's only 8.4 hours. It's almost entirely decayed in those three days, and so we have a lot less activity present then. Questions about that? So there were a lot of steps involved, I understand, and if you have trouble with any of them, please come see us and ask because you will see it again. Okay, number three, uh, this was the nuclear structure kind of problem. And so, again, it had a bunch of parts. Uh, the, first, the first one was to predict the ground state spin and parity of molybdenum 100. Again, the idea was, I didn't expect you to know the Z and N of this particular isotope, but given the A number and the name of the element, you could look up in the periodic table what the Z is and find that it's 42, and therefore that the neutron number must be 58. And so this is one of those even-even nuclei, and we've discussed this a lot, that in the even-even nuclei what happens is all of the neutrons pair up with their spins pointed in opposite directions, so they add up to a total spin of zero, and all the protons similarly pair up with their spins in opposite directions to give us a total spin of zero. And so for every single even-even nuclei, they all have ground state spin and parities of zero plus. Okay. Now some people used sort of vague words about pairing and said, well, the neutrons all pair up. And you'll see a lot of comments, pair up in what way? Okay. And it has to do with the spin. And you'll see similar comments on another problem a little bit later. Uh, sulfur 33, the idea here was now you've got an odd A nucleus. So again, you figure out the Z and the N from the name of the element and the A number. So it's 16 protons, that's because it's sulfur. And the even protons all pair up to spin zero. Whereas we've got a 17th neutron, and in the single particle shell model, we attribute the ground state spin and parity at least to that of that last odd either neutron or proton. In this case, it's a neutron. And we use the shell model orbital scheme that I showed you um, in the version I gave you, I purposely did not put the numbers of particles you could put into each orbital there. That was something I hoped you would remember or be able to figure out, that you can put two J plus one particles into each state of a given spin J. And so given the J values there, you could figure out how many particles would go into each orbital. And you then figure out that the 17th neutron would have to go into the 1D three halves orbital. And that D means that L equals 2. And so the parity, which goes as minus 1 to the L, would be positive. And so on the basis of the single particle shell model, we would predict the ground state spin and parity of sulfur 33 to be 3 halves plus. And in fact, it is. Experimentally, that's the right value. Um, the next one was copper 64. So this is one of these odd, odd guys. Okay, So now you go and look and discover copper has Z of 29. Uh, this particular isotope, therefore, has an N of 35. And we want to figure out what the ground state spin and parity of this nucleus is. So now we've got both an odd proton and an odd neutron. So we go through the shell model scheme again. And what we find is that the 29th proton must go into the 2p3 halves. And what I'm trying to show you over here is that, okay, this is a 3 halves negative parity. In order to get an L value of 1, which is what the P means, to produce a J value of 3 halves, that means the L and S vectors must be parallel to one another Okay, for that particular orbital. Now we go to the 35th neutron. Similarly, we go through the shell model and we find that it must be in a 1F 5 halves orbital. So the 35th neutron would give us J pi of 5 halves minus. But in order to have F, e F which is 3, add with s to give us 5 halves, the l and the s vectors must be pointing in opposite directions in that case. Okay, And so now we're trying to figure out what the ground state spin and parity of copper 64 is going to be. We have to add together 
five halves minus and three halves minus. And these are vectors, okay? So the rule of thumb is you can have any combination from the algebraic sum to the algebraic difference of these things as possible spins. So in this case, if I add five halves and three halves, I get eight halves or four. And if I take the difference, I have five halves minus three halves, that's one. And I also have to fill in the blanks, so there's three and two also as possible spins and parities. The parity we get by multiplying the parity of the neutron and proton. If I've got more than one particle that contributes, in, as in the case of an odd-odd nucleus, we multiply parities. The parities here are each negative, so negative times negative is positive. So at this point, you would say that the spin is going to be 4, 3, 2, or 1, and positive parity. The question of which one of those is the more likely, and this has to do with something we talked about, which is that when you have a situation like this, the most likely case, but not always, but the most likely case is when the spin of the neutron and the spin of the proton are parallel. Sorry, this should say P, typo. Um, that doesn't mean the J vectors, it means the intrinsic spin vectors, as we saw in the deuteron. Remember, the deuteron is the one bound state of the neutron and proton, and it turns out it's when the proton spin and neutron spin are in the same direction. So in order to have the proton and neutron spins parallel, these J vectors have to be pointing in opposite directions, right? Because in one of them, the, J, the S is down, and the other one, the S is up. So to get the two S's pointing in the same direction, I have to subtract them, basically, which means the most likely spin in parity for the copper 64 is the lower value, one plus. And experimentally, it turns out, in this case, it is true, okay? But if you got to here, you were gonna get most of the points. This was a few extra points right at the end. Okay. That was 64, uh, right, okay. D was chromium 54, and the question was to predict the spin and parity of the first excited state. So first of all, again, you use the periodic table to figure out this is an even, even nucleus. And we've studied even, even nuclei, and there were two basic classes of excitation schemes we saw one having to do with vibrations of the nucleus and one having to do with rotations. And the idea was in both cases, the first excited state is always a two almost always a two plus. In the rotational case, it's always a two plus. In the vibrational case, it's almost always a two plus. So if you simply said it's an even, even nucleus and it's either a vibration or rotation and therefore a two plus, you would have gotten credit. Um, to decide which it is, you have to know where in the periodic table each of these kind of mechanisms dominates. And we talked about the fact that for nuclei with A less than about 150, most even even nuclei show vibrational spectra. And so the first excited state of a vibrational nucleus is produced by adding one quadrupole phonon to the ground state. That produces a spin and parity of two plus. Okay, but if you didn't know that and said it's either rotation or vibration, you'd still predict two plus. And then the last one was, in this case, a real uh, rotational problem. So this is the um, spectrum of U232. And what I said was the first excited state of U232 is a J pi equals two plus state at 47.6 keV. And the question then was using that information to predict the excitation energy of the fourth excited state. And so the idea here is that this is in not this part of the chart of the nuclides, but in the heavier part, where rotation is the way we get excitations for even, even nuclei. Um, and we expect a sequence of excited states that goes zero plus, two plus, four plus, six plus, eight plus, when we have rotation. And the energies are, go as some constant, which we don't know a priori, times j, j plus one, where j is the spin of that particular state. So in this problem, I gave you the energy of the first excited state, 47.6 keV, and the idea is to plug it into that formula and figure out what the constant is. So for that state, J equals two, J plus one is three. So 47.6 keV is six times this constant, and therefore the constant is 7.93 keV. And the fourth excited state would be the eight plus level, okay? And so the energy of that would be eight times eight plus one or nine times 7.93 and you get 571 keV. And it turns out that's not very far off from the experimentally observed value. I think it's 540 something, okay? 
Okay, so that was number three. Any questions about that? Okay. And number four, here was your chance for creative writing. Um, so the first part was I gave you the binding energy formula and asked you to explain what each of those terms meant. And some people simply wrote down the names that we attributed to these things. So if you said it's volume, surface, coulomb, symmetry, I didn't give you many points for that because those are just words, okay? It doesn't explain physically what's going on there and that's what I was after. Um, so let's go through that in a little more detail. So the first one is what we call the volume term. And again, there was some misunderstanding about this. Some people were saying that of course the binding energy just grows linearly with A as you add more and more nucleons. But if you think about it, there's something more subtle going on. Because if I added nucleons one at a time and each one of them interacted with all the other nucleons in the nucleus, the binding energy per nucleon would go as A but then the total binding energy, which is what this formula is all about, would go as A squared. So there's something more subtle going on. And the more subtle thing is that the nuclear force has a finite range. It's not like the Coulomb force or gravity. And so a nucleon buried in the center of the nucleus really doesn't notice so much all the nucleons in the nucleus. They only see their nearest neighbors. And so there's this idea of saturation of the nuclear force that says, I'm, if I can, I will bind with X number of nearest neighbors and nothing beyond that. And that's true for each nucleon. There's a fixed binding energy per nucleon, and therefore the total binding energy goes like A. As I add more nucleons, I just add the same binding energy per unit. Okay? And the reason that, and that's positive because um, it's an attractive nuclear force, so that leads to binding energy. Uh, the next one is the surface term, and you know, some people said it's surface tension, and that's a classical way we describe this, but really what's going on is related to what I just said a minute ago, that for those nucleons that are near the surface, they have nearest neighbors basically on one side of them and nothing on the other side, so they see less binding energy per nucleon than the ones in the interior. The surface area, which is a way to count how many nucleons are in that vicinity, goes as A to the two-thirds, because it goes as the square of the uh, radius, the surface area. And it's negative because it reduces the binding energy. For those nucleons near the surface, since they have fewer nearest neighbors, they are less tightly bound. That's why the sign is negative. Uh, the third term, the Coulomb term, right? What I was looking for is for you to say that there's a repulsive force between the protons which counteracts the attractive nature of the nuclear force. So it leads to less binding energy and hence a negative sign. And if you wanted to say that you know, the total uh, Coulomb energy goes as Q squared over R. Again, you got some brownie points for that. Uh, most people got that part of it. This, the next term, the symmetry term, again, there seems to be a little bit of misunderstanding about this. The idea here is what it's telling you is that as you move away from N equals Z, as you move, if you make the numerator here non-zero, it costs you binding energy, whether you have an excess of neutrons or an excess of protons, that costs you energy. And some people were saying that's a result of the fact that the nuclear force between the neutrons and neutrons is different than that between the neutrons and protons and between the protons and protons. That's not true. We went through that. They're all essentially the same. What is going on here is that, remember, these particles are all fermions, and so we can't put more than a single one in a given quantum mechanical state. And so as I start putting particles in, I have to fill up those shell model orbitals, if you want to think of it that way. And since the nuclear force is charge symmetric, that is, it really doesn't distinguish between neutrons and protons, if that's all that were going on, we'd always have n equals z. And that would be the lowest uh, mass system. However, there is the Coulomb force which affects the protons and doesn't affect the neutrons. So remember, the shell model orbitals for the protons actually get shifted up a bit relative to those of the neutrons. And as I add more and more protons, I'm forcing them to go to higher and higher levels. And similarly, as I add more and more neutrons, I force them to go to higher and higher levels. So there is a balance which shifts things a little bit away from n equals z, but it costs you energy to go too far in either direction. Okay, so it's a, it's a slightly complicated argument, um, but it's a combination of the Pauli principle, the Coulomb interaction, and the fact that the nuclear force is charge symmetric that we were looking for. And then the final thing had to do with the pairing term. People said pairing or coupling, but didn't explain exactly what they meant by that. And the idea there was what we talked about earlier, that 
the neutrons and protons like to pair up with light type particles. So the neutrons like to pair up with other neutrons to make spin zero. That leads to more binding energy. The protons like to pair up with other protons to make spin zero. And if you have odd numbers, they don't have anybody to pair up with, and so that costs you energy. Okay? And then the last part of the problem had to do with actually applying that formula to a particular situation, which is the beta decay of sodium-25 to magnesium-25. And again, there seems to be a little bit of a confusion about how you calculate a Q value. So the way you calculate a Q value is always the same regardless of whether you're talking about a radioactive decay or a nuclear reaction. What you want to measure is the difference between the mass you start with and the mass you end up with. Okay? So in this case, the Q value for the beta decay is the difference in mass between my parent, which is sodium-25, and the daughter, which is magnesium-25. Okay, some people calculated the difference in binding energies, and that's part of the story, but that's not the whole story. Um, what you have to remember is that the mass of sodium-25 is calculated in terms of the number of protons and neutrons in the nucleus, as well as the binding energy. So I didn't give you the whole mass formula, I gave you the binding energy formula. And you were supposed to remember or be able to figure out that the mass of sodium-25 would be 11 times, and here's a little subtlety, it's the mass of a hydrogen atom, okay? Because some people were carrying along an extra mass of the electron in this equation, and you don't need to do that if you do everything in terms of atomic mass units. And the mass that was given there for 1H, rather than saying the mass of a proton, was that's the mass of a hydrogen atom. So the electron mass is already accounted for in the way of writing it this way, and so there is no electron mass that appears in that Q value. It, it's all, it all cancels out. So the mass of sodium-25 is 11 times the mass of a hydrogen atom plus 14 times the mass of a neutron. That gets multiplied by C squared, and then we subtract from that the binding energy of sodium-25 that we calculate from that, from that binding energy formula. And similarly for magnesium-25, and notice that the number of neutrons and protons is different here. And when I take the difference between those two masses, what remains from all this mass is the difference between the mass of a neutron and the mass of a hydrogen atom. And now I've got plus the difference in binding energies between magnesium-25 and sodium-25. And you could use the whole binding energy formula, but if you notice, there are a bunch of terms in there which go like A, and A is the same for sodium and magnesium-25, so those terms cancel out. These are both odd A nuclei, so the delta doesn't contribute. So there are really only two terms in that messy formula that matter. There's the Coulomb term because we've got different numbers of protons in the magnesium and the sodium, and the symmetry term because we've got a different difference between the numbers of neutrons and protons. In magnesium, N is uh, 13 and Z is 12, and in the sodium, N is 14 and Z is 11. So you plug it in, and if you do the arithmetic, I believe correctly, the difference in binding energy is 1.944 MeV. And for those people who calculated that and said it was the Q value, you got most but not all the points on the problem. And if you then use the fact that you have to include the difference in mass between the neutron and the hydrogen, the Q value is 2.726 MeV which is not exactly the experimentally measured one, but it's as close as you can get using that formula. Okay, any questions about that? Okay. So again, if you have issues with the way things were graded, come see us. Um, and remember, you know, think about where you are on this distribution, you know, if you're up in here, you're doing well, keep up the good work. If you're down here, you know, time to get working a little bit harder. There will be a second exam. So this isn't the end of the story. I don't want people to get discouraged if they happen to have, you know, not so hot a score. Um, it's a wake-up call. Take it that way. Um, there's lots of opportunity to raise the grade. There will be a second midterm, which now, you know, one thing you should think about is you've sort of calibrated me now and I've calibrated you. You have a better feel for the kind of exams I give. The second one will be similar. Uh, the one thing you have to remember is that everything we do in this class builds on all the stuff we've done before. So it's not that you can forget about this stuff and think I'm just gonna learn the new stuff and I'll be fine. Uh, unfortunately, it doesn't work that way. So there'll be another midterm which will be in four or five weeks. 
which will count the same as this. There'll be a final, which counts twice as much, and that's going to cover everything. And um, hopefully by now you've come to see that the homework really does prepare you for the exam. So if you do the homework and understand that, you're going to do fine here. I'm not going to surprise you with stuff you haven't seen before. Um, anything else about that? I'm not going to give you another lecture today. I think you've had enough for this week. Um, but I would like to prepare you for a couple things. So next week I'm away. I have a conference that I'm going to be attending, so I'm away all of the week. But I've got really good guest lectures lined up. You'll enjoy them. Uh, so there'll be class as usual, even though I'm not here. Um, what will happen is if you've looked at our syllabus, we're actually a little bit ahead of where I thought we were going to be at this point. So we're going to slow things down a bit and get back to closer to being on the syllabus. So what will happen next week is we'll finish up the discussion of beta decay with the thing I told you I would talk about today, which was electron capture. And then we'll also do the discussion of alpha decay. And then we'll start at the end of next week the beginnings of nuclear reactions. And that'll get us back much closer to what the syllabus says we're going to be doing. Um, I didn't have a chance before class to figure out the next homework assignment, but I will post it this afternoon. So you're not off the hook. There will be a homework assignment due next Wednesday. Um, uh, next Friday, sorry. sorry. Sorry, next Friday. Just I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, what else? And let's see. So the semester is running by. I don't know if it's flying for you guys, but it's flying for me. OK, and what I'm realizing is um, one of the things I like to do in this class we're going to talk about accelerators, and we've talked about them to some extent already, is how many people would be interested in going on a tour of the 88-inch cyclotron at LBL? OK, most of you. I know some of you have already been up there. The grad students mainly have been there, but you're welcome to come again. So in looking at the schedule, I was thinking about Friday, November 6th. Um, and I want to make sure that people don't have exams that day. So the idea is I pick a Friday because we've got a two-hour block of time when most people aren't tied up. It takes a little while to get up there and down. So we would use that Friday two-hour block to go up to the cyclotron. If you can't make it, send me an email and let me know. When, when, like what time of the day? No, it, it would be the 12 to 2 block when we normally, oh, okay. when we normally have class. So we leave here at 12? We would leave here at 12, right. We would meet up there. I'll tell you how to get there as we get closer to that. But uh, OK, let me know if that doesn't work. But if it works for most people, let's tentatively assume Friday, November 6th, we won't have class. There'll be a homework assignment, of course, due. But um, we'll go to the cyclotron and see that. And by that point, I think we will have had at least our first discussions of accelerators, so it'll make some sense when we go up there. OK. And last but not least, the evil prince and the seven dwarves. Uh, we've got to finish that up. So a couple people came to me with solutions. Anybody else have a solution? Let's just remember the problem again. Okay, so this guy gets to see all the other hats, one, two, three, four, five, six in front of him. He gets to say red or green, and if he gets his hat correct, he lives. If he doesn't, he dies. And then the next one in turn does the same thing. And what I said as the hint was, you can save all these guys and you have a 50-50 chance of saving that guy. Okay, so for those who already told me their answers, which were right, don't, don't say it. But does anyone else have an idea? Once you see it, it'll seem obvious. Yeah? I was just wondering, couldn't you No, there's no cheating involved here, OK? It, there's a straightforward way to do it. Actually, there's more than one. I heard a variation on this, which also works. So let's pick a particular example. It doesn't really matter. But suppose it looked like this. Suppose this guy was red. And this guy is red. And this guy is green. And this guy is green. And this guy is red. And this guy is red. And this guy is green. Did I do that right? I've got one, two, three, four. No. Red, red. Green, green. One, two, three, four, five, six. Oh, I wrote down too many. Okay. Red, this is green. Green, green, red, red, green, green. Suppose it were like that, just for example. Okay. 
So the night before, the dwarves are in that cell, scared to death about what's going to happen to them tomorrow. And they discuss this. And the agreement is, this guy is willing to take his chances for the good of everybody else. Okay, because he has no way of knowing what color the hat is on his head. But he can say something which will tell everybody else the color of their hat. And he's a noble guy, so he agrees to do it and figures he'll take his chances 50-50. Okay, the deal is he gets to see all the other hats in front of him. And the agreement is if he sees an even number of red hats in front of him, he's going to say red. If he sees an odd number of red hats in front of him, he's going to say green. Okay, now watch what happens, okay? So the deal is he's going to look down here, and if there's an even number, he's going to say red. So in the example I chose, there happened to be two red hats there, which is an even number. So since I wanted to make this a positive thing, I also made his hat red. So he says red, he lives. He's a hero, and he saves everybody else, and he saves himself. But if it had been green, he would have died, but everyone else would still live. So think about it. He says red, and everybody is into this clue, right? They all know what red really means. So this guy now looks down the row, and he sees also an even number of red hats. And he's smart, so he realizes his hat can't be red, because if it were, there would be three red hats altogether. That's an odd number. So he knows his hat has to be green. So he says green and he lives. And you work it all the way down the chain, they all live that way. Okay? And you can rewrite it and make it some other combination. It always works. Your question? It's a cute problem. It's a cute problem, right? Okay, and you can see why Bill Gates might have done it, because it's a binary thing. Okay, okay. I like those things. And I'll, again, if you have some of your own, bring them in, we'll share them, but I think that's kind of cute. Okay, we're going to call it quits for today, and I'll see you a week from Monday, but there is class next week.